This is what's commonly known as a history book. It's a book that deals with the past. The past is all neat and tidy and organized into themes such as the Enlightenment, the ancient world, the history of the medieval Far East, the Aztec period, etc. It's all neatly categorized. Um, and in a sense, um, what we do to the past is we, we uh, sort of ossify it. We create an actual past that we all agree upon is the past. Uh, and we say, that is history. Um, I've spent my entire life looking at history, and to the, so far, to the best of uh, uh, my abilities, I still haven't been able to wrap my head around what history actually is when I stop and think about it. That doesn't particularly bother me or discourage me from studying it, but it does tend to sort of confuse everything when you're attempting to draw any conclusions from history. Um, because we don't really know what it is when we stop and think about it. And in many ways, or I suppose in every way, that mirrors our view of what the past is. I've got a link below to um, uh, someone looking uh, out the back window of a moving car, probably a taxi, and I think it's in New York City. Somebody is looking back towards the um, appearing... Um, the things that are appearing behind the cab as the cab drives forward. So the person, the point of view of the person in this um, photograph, the, per, the point of view of the photographer, is looking backwards through the rear rear window of a moving vehicle. So things are, as it were, coming like this. Now that's our view of the past, uh, or our view of time, I suppose. Um, things appear, they are visible for a while, and they recede off into the distance and eventually vanish at, at the vanishing point in this photograph. Things that come into our point of view when we first see them. They appear for a while, and then they either disappear, because say it's, um, it's a, a finite point um, of something that we can see, but then it actually disappears. We either don't see them anymore, don't think of them anymore, or we forget them, and they vanish beyond the vanishing point. But things just keep coming. So as we forget one thing, something else appears, and, and ad infinitum. So we're looking backwards, and we're seeing the past alter. We're seeing the past constantly come at us, go off into the distance, and then disappear. And when it disappears, the only way that we can retain it is by doing this, writing about it or whatever. <clears throat> now, that's the conventional view of time. What Benatar has done, and one of the things that fascinates me so much, and one of the things that Schlock of God has Raised one of the objections that he's raised, or at least it's triggered this kind of thinking in my mind. What if the person in the person with the camera in this, in the context of this photograph that I've linked to, stopped looking backwards out the rear view mirror and turned around and looked over the driver's shoulder? through the windshield. <laughs> now, <laughs> what if they saw the future, or they saw time itself, rather, from that perspective? They saw the things coming at them from whence they came, not going away. <laughs> what would the vanishing point look like in that dynamic? And why is this any less valid than looking backwards? Why isn't looking forward a problem? Well, the thing is, people say, well, we can't see what's going to come. Well, we can't really see what's behind either, because it's all distorted. It's all our own flawed perceptions of time. <laughs> Things like this 
tend to sort of get confusing when one is first confronted by them, or at least one attempts to at least work them out that way. Um, and in a certain sense, some people might hold that, say, if you did turn all the way around and look through the windshield of that moving taxi, you might be driven insane. You might be horrified by what you see, because you're looking directly into the face of potentiality, the very face of creation. Um, you're looking into what will happen as opposed to what has happened. Because even when we have things like time travel um, in, in our literature, in our science fiction and everything, we do tend to put people into a future where they do end up looking backwards into, uh, they look through the rear view, the rear mirror, uh, the rear <laughs> window of that taxi. Again, they have the same perspective even though they've gone into the future. So let's just say that we keep in the present, but we turn around and we look over the driver's shoulder, directly into the face of creation. Um, that's a very, very disorienting concept, a very disorienting thought, and some people might even find it disturbing. But there's no reason to assume that, um, that it's not possible. It might not look like our accustomed view of time, but that doesn't mean that it's not valid. Now, the reason why I bring this up in the context of Benatar and asymmetry and Schlock's um, view of agency is that um, Benatar seems to uh, imply that all that stuff that's coming all that stuff that we would see over the driver's shoulder through the windshield has the potential to be abolished with the ending of sentience. <laughs> In other words, all that mind-blowing potentiality can be halted. And I think that that's one of the things that a lot of people find so weird about Benatarian thinking is that in the in the instance of one little thing harm which unfortunately it is a little thing in terms of the entirety of the physical universe and and what I, I don't know what we, we would call the space-time continuum uh, everything harm is just one of those little things that we would see coming at us through the windshield um, what about everything else <laughs> What about all the other things that are being blasted right into our face as we look into the future? Not look into what the future past would look like, <laughs> um, but what the actual becoming is. What the actual potential is. What creation itself, or uh, <laughs> what the onrush of the future would look like. In other words, uh, there's another way of looking at it. We're sitting in a fast-flowing stream. We've got our um, head uh, sitting uh, with its back towards this really powerful current. But it's not so bad because we have a strong neck and the water is going this way. What if we turn around and the water hits us right in the face? It's completely different. It's totally different. And I would think that the, the, uh, the impact of seeing potentiality, the impact of seeing this onrush of becoming, would be even more disorienting than the most powerful uh, current we can imagine. I think it would be more like a fire hose right in the face. And, and I think that because this concept is so hard to wrap one's head around, a lot of people sort of disregard it. Like we, we tend to sort of say, okay, well, this is just too much. This blows the mind. We can't see potentiality that way. So we'll just pretend, at least for the sake of utility, that it isn't there. Which creates a vacuum into which people like Benatar strut and say, there's something in there that is bad that will eventually be here now and will eventually go off into the past, which is called harm. We must abolish that harm by abolishing anything that we see coming at us over the shoulder of the taxi driver through the windshield. Um, 
And Schlock has pointed out, and he's raised the objection that harm isn't the only thing that's going to hit us in the face if we turn around. There is as much in the becoming, there's as much in the potentiality that is going to fly over our shoulders um, and hit us in the face and go back that way when we turn around and have the same perspective as the taxi driver as there is behind us now. There's as much, in other words, in the becoming, in the potential, in uh, the um, uh, the future, or not even really the future, but there's as, there's as much in the endless becoming of what will happen as there is in the picture that I've linked to below. Um, just because we have sort of equipped ourselves to see the other way through the rear window of the taxi doesn't mean that looking through the windshield of the taxi is any less um, multi, multifarious, uh, multi-everything as the past is. Benatar has switched around time and perception on some people or on us all, but only in one small little thing. What he's raised is, with his idea of potentials, is um, disorienting in the extreme uh, if you actually take the potential and see the potential everything. Not just potential human beings, but potential everything. Um, it is there. If we're going to accept his potential human beings, let's look at potential everything. It's, uh, as I say, it's a, it's a disturbing idea, but I think that the, it, the very fact that it's disturbing has allowed Benatar to sort of pull a fast one on us all. I don't think he's doing this consciously. Um, well, I, again, I don't, I, I won't say that, but I, because I don't really know what he's actually thinking. But it looks as though um, he's opened that can of worms unintentionally, and the only way to actually deal with the can of worms that he's opened in altering the way we perceive time itself is to go the whole hog is to turn our heads around and face that fire hose right in the face. Take the fire hose right in the face. And Schlock has said that, okay, we're losing agency because agency is becoming. Harm is becoming. What else is becoming? Everything. Can we really abolish that? In this sort of context of, of completely altering one's perception and one, or one's point of view of time and becoming and potentiality itself, creation itself, um, trying to eliminate harm looks almost ludicrously puny. <laughs> Thank you.